It is certainly a pleasure to be here this morning. And I first want to give thanks to the leadership here and the elders who have given me this opportunity to speak to you this morning. Also, I want to thank the congregation as well for allowing my family and I to visit with you and giving me this opportunity to preach the gospel. Uh, we're always appreciative of all that you do, and um, we definitely appreciate all the hospitality, the nice, kind words, the handshakes, and the smiles that you all have uh, provided to us as we come to visit. And, you know, personally, I always consider it a privilege to have the opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so anytime I have this chance, I get excited and I am uh, just elated that you all are giving me this opportunity. And this morning, if you have your Bibles, please open to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 12. We'll take our message from there this morning. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And the title of today's message is going to be Running the Christian Race. Running the Christian Race race. Now how we live our lives while we are on this earth has a direct impact on where we will spend eternity. And when we try to live this life, this Christian life, sometimes it can be difficult because there are many distractions in our society. There are many things that can come in and take our attention away from God. And so it's not an easy thing to live a Christian life in the type of society we live in today. Now, this passage that we read here in Hebrews, the writer here is describing the life we live or the, or the Christian life that we live as a race that, is, uh, that we run. And what I want to do is take the, the verses there, uh, look at it, and we, we will do some interpretation and make some application, and then the message will be yours. But how do we live a life in a society in which we live and still remain faithful to God? Because it's not always easy. And as we look at this passage and we think about running the Christian race, I think the first thing that we must understand about running the Christian race is that we must line up at the window. And what I mean by line up at the window, line up at the registration window. You see, in order to run the race, we must first be registered in the race. Getting into the race is just as important as running the race. You see, it's possible for a person to run the race and, uh, and not be in the race. Imagine if a person was in the Olympics and they were running the 100 meter dash and everyone lined up at the starting blocks. And then you have another individual who's just outside the lines, maybe in the grass, and the gun goes off and everybody runs to the finish line. And when they get to the finish line, the person who ran the race that was outside of the lines, they are not going to be recognized at the award ceremony. Why not? Because they were never in the race. And so it's very important for us to understand 
that we must first get into the race if we're going to be rewarded at the end of the race. And I submit to you today that in order to run the Christian race, we must be registered at the uh, cross of Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. And what does it cost us? It costs us honesty when we read the word of God. It costs us obedience. It's going to cost us sincerity. It's going to cost us humility. When we are willing to do those things, then we can be registered for the race. Now, you know, a lot of times when you are registering for a race, any type of competition of, of that matter, you must have some type of uh, identification, some way for people to know that you belong here. And I believe God has given us that in his word when he tells us we must be born again. You see, when we read John chapter 3 and verses 3 through 5, the Bible says, Jesus said, uh, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nicodemus said unto him, How can this be so? Can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. See, we must first be registered in the race, and that requires us to be born again. Now, there are some people in this life who are running the Christian race. They are living good moral lives. They may be going to church every Sunday. They may be giving, giving of their means. They may be praying to God every, every day. They may be doing all the things that a person should do if they were going to call themselves a Christian, but these people would not be rewarded at the end of the race. Why? Because they never got in the race. You see, Satan doesn't care if you run. Satan says, run on, run all you want to run. As long as you don't get in the race, when you get to the end of life, you're not going to get the reward that you thought you were going to get. So before we begin to think about running the Christian race, we must first understand that we must line up at the window. But look at the text. The text says, wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. See, not only must we line up at the window, but we must learn from the witnesses. See, the Bible says here, when you see wherefore, wherefore connects what the writer is about to say to what has already been stated previously. So we know previously Hebrews chapter 11, which we all have read and People have come to understand Hebrews chapter 11 to be the hall of faith. All the great men and women of the Bible are mentioned there, and, and they were mentioned about how great a faith they had. So those individuals that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11 have already run the race, and they are examples for us. They are witnesses to us, just as if you were uh, in the Olympic stadium and a person gets ready to run around the track in the race, and you have all the people in the stands sitting there watching them run around the track, and people are in the stands cheering them on. They are encouraging, encouraging them to continue on and fight forward so that they can finish the race. This is similar to what the writer is saying to us, not that the people in heaven are watching us, but as we live in the theater of life, we have some witnesses that is, we have some people that we can look at their testimony and we can learn from them and it can encourage us to continue to run the race. Their lives are a testimony for us to draw upon as examples about how to live. So you go back to Hebrews chapter 11 and you see Abel teaches us how we ought to worship. So he offered his his worship to God by faith. Enoch teaches us how we can walk with God and God will accept us. Noah teaches us how it is important to prepare ourselves. And also he teaches us that we should persevere in the face of adversity when the whole world is against us. Noah teaches us that we can continue to believe and trust 
in God. Abraham teaches us that we can obey God, even if it means to give up the thing that I love the most. And if I'm willing to obey God to that point, then God will provide a way. Sarah teaches us that we can always have hope. Despite her age, Sarah always believed and hoped and in God that he would fulfill his promise. You see, no matter what we are dealing with in our lives, we can always have hope. And that's what Sarah teaches us. Daniel teaches us that we can be courageous and we can always stand for what's right, knowing that if we stand for what's right and we are courageous, then God will deliver us. Joseph, uh, one of the 12 brothers, of the tribes of Israel, he teaches us how we can run away from sin. And he also teaches us that we can have compassion on people who have wronged us, even when they don't deserve it. Look at all the apostles. Each and every one of the apostles teach us, they teach us that we have to sometimes leave everything that we own everything that we believe in, everything that we've always had in our lives. Why? To follow Jesus. All the apostles uh, or disciples at that time, they left their homes and they left their families. They did it all to follow Christ. We learned from the apostles that we have to die to ourselves in order to follow Christ. These are the testimonies. When we look around and see all the people who have lived a life in obedience to God, they show us that it can be done. Look in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter uh, 11 and verse 32. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32 there. The Bible says, and, and what shall I say more? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and also of Samuel of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the fiery uh, violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword out of the weakness they were um, made strong, wax valiant in flight, turned to flight the armies of aliens. Women received their dead, raised a life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of the bonds of imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, and in the dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God had providing some better thing for us, that they without should not be made perfect. You see, all the people and all the things that they've experienced, and that teaches us. You see, we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses as we run this race. Those Christians who are running the race today, uh, we have encouragement not only from the people we read about in the Bible, but what about all the people that you have known in your life that have gone on to be with the Lord? You see, they serve as an example for us that we can remain faithful. And not just the people in the Bible and the people that you have known throughout your lifetime. What about the person sitting in the pew next to you? We all can be witnesses to one another to testify to each other that we can run the Christian race and we can uh, be faithful to God and be successful. Line up at the window. 
We must learn from the witnesses. But also we must lay aside the weight. See, the Hebrew writer says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Notice there's a difference between uh, a weight and a sin. You see, sin will always bring you down. But there are some things that we can do in our lives that are not sin, but it can make it difficult for us to run the race. Now, now weights are things that slow us down. They hinder us. They impede our uh, progress. They make it hard for us. Imagine trying to run a marathon with a 50-pound backpack on. How difficult that would be in comparison to running a marathon with with no uh, 50 pound weight to, strapped to your back. Now, oftentimes runners in that day, what they would do, they would try to um, take off as many clothes as possible so that they can be as light as possible when they run the race so they can help them as they run. People still do it today. When you watch uh, the Olympic games or any type of uh, race, you see people, they wear very little clothing and the clothing is very thin. And the reason why they wear clothing like that is because they don't want anything to hold them down. They don't want any excess weight. They want to have an advantage. So they want to be free from any burdens and anything that might hinder them while they run the race. Now, this is what the Hebrew writer is saying to us. Let us lay aside every weight. What is it in your life that's making it difficult for you to live the Christian life? The writer says, lay it aside. We have to put it off. Things such as setting our affections on things of this earth. You see, Paul says, set your affections on things above and not on things of this earth. See, if you set your affection on things of this earth, it's going to hold you down. Jesus even said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. It's not saying that it's a sin. But what he's saying is that it's going to be harder for you to run the race if you have some things in your life. What about uh, the love of money? Says the root of all evil. What about procrastination? What about apathy? Apathy is person, I just don't care about certain things. What about fear? What about worry? See, all these things that we can be involved in or they can be a part of our lives, not necessarily a sin, but it's gonna make it hard for you to run the Christian race. So he says, let us lay aside every weight. And then he says, the sin which does so easily beset us. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, he says that you put off the former man concerning the former way of life of the old man, which was corrupt to the deceitful, according to the deceitful lust. Hebrews, not Hebrews, uh, Ephesians. Chapter 4 and verse 22 there down to about verse 24. But he says the sin which does so easily beset us. And I think some translations has entangled us. So that, that is a sin uh, drags us down. It makes it harder to run the race. Uh, some people will look, look at that word beset and it has the idea to distract. They lay aside the sins that distract us. Anything that distracts us from God, when we focus on ourselves rather than focusing on God, is going to hinder us as we run the race. You see, sin is detrimental to all of our lives. And there's, there's a list of sins in the Bible, and you know what they are. But the point is, is that if we have any sins in our lives, then the writer says we need to lay it aside because it's going to make it hard for you to run the race as long as you have sin in your life. He says lay it aside. So we have to line up at the window. We have to learn from the witnesses. We have to lay aside all the weights that's going to hinder us while we run the race. But also we must learn to withstand. Look at it there. Let us run with patience. The race that is set before us, the, the word patience there literally means to endure. So let us run with endurance. Oh, the, that race that is set 
before us, to endure, means the characteristic of a man or a woman who is not swerved from his or her deliberate purpose and his or her loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials or sufferings. See, there are going to be some difficulties in life that we all have to deal with. There are going to be some challenges in life that we're all going to have to face and overcome. There are going to be some temptations that we're all going to have to deal with. There are going to be some trials that we're going to have to work our way through in our lives. But what God is saying to us is that he's asking us to endure. Just be strong and stick it out to the end. If you stay faithful to God, then he's going to save you in the end. That's what he says. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You see, it's going to take a certain amount of perseverance in order to live this life in such a way that we hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It's not going to be easy, but one thing we can count on is that God is always going to be there. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. So as we run this race, there has to be some endurance. But look at what he says is the race that has been set before us. The race is already set, right? The word, the, the, the idea there, the race has been set. The course has already been mapped out. Right? Uh, uh, John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is of the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So those are the only three ways that Satan can tempt you. Right, the course is already mapped out. There's three ways that Satan is going to try to attack us. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But also John says in 1 John 5 and verse 4, he says, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. The course has already been set. And all we have to do today is to just endure the race until the end. Now, there are different types of races. Uh, that, that, that we can run. All races are not the same. You know, some races are sprints and some races are marathons. Now, the type of race that you run is going to have an uh, impact on how you prepare for the race. It's going to impact how you actually run the race when you get in the race. You see, if you take the wrong approach to the race, then you may end up losing the race. So if the race is a sprint, then what do you do? That means you want to use up all the energy you can so that you can get to the finish line as fast as you can. If the race is a marathon, right, you want to conserve your energy and pace yourself so that you can have enough to get to the finish line. So what am I saying? The Christian race is not a sprint. I know a lot of us, when we first became baptized, we were all excited. And we were gung-ho about everything, and we wanted to go out and save the world. And then soon, soon that fire kind of slowed down a little bit, and we realized, well, maybe I can't save everybody. But that's because we, we approach it the, we, in, in a certain way that may have not been the most helpful. All right? So we, we must treat the Christian race as if it's a long-distance marathon. Paul even says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. See, one thing we have to understand about the Christian race is that the Christian race is a process, not a contest. Now stay with me. I want, I want to say that again. Uh, don't, 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 don't leave me here. The, the Christian race 
is a process, not a contest. We are not racing against each other. We are racing against the course, so to speak, the world. Right? Uh, many people have this mentality today. They think it's all about, I want to try to outdo you. I want to do more than you. You do more than me, so on and so forth. And that, that's how we live in our society in general. Right? Uh, but but that, that's not the way it should be in the church. In 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, Paul says, for we dare not compare ourselves to ourselves. Then he says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. You see, we are all in the same boat. We are all living on the same earth, living in the same world. We're all striving, trying to make it to the same place. And so we ought not be in competition with each other, but we need to learn to have more compassion toward one another. You see, when we are running the race and we see our brother or our sister stumble and fall, we don't step over them. We don't uh, uh, pass by on the other side like the priest and the Levite. What do we do? When we see our brother and sister stumble and fall, then we stop and we lift them up so that we can all finish the race together. So what am I saying? I'm saying we have to learn that as we run this Christian race, it's going to take some endurance. And we also have to understand and learn that we need each other. I can't do it without you. And you can't do it without me. We are all in this together, trying to make it to heaven. All right, my last point this morning. We must line up at the window. We must learn from the witnesses. We lay aside all the weights. We learn to withstand, but we must look to the winner. Look at what your Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We already have a winner. And he serves as an example to us all. Just as we looked at the witnesses that have paved the way for us, we should look even more closely at Jesus Christ. Jesus gives us the how-to or the blueprint on how to run the race. The Bible says that he is the author or the instructor and the finisher of our faith. That is, Jesus shows us the way, and not only that, he finishes it for us and shows us that if we live a faithful life to God in obedience, that when we die, we will be resurrected to live in heaven with God, our Father. Jesus is the winner. And the looking to Jesus means that we have our undivided focus and attention. That is, we look so intently at Jesus that we eliminate any other thing in our sight. It's like we don't even have peripheral vision. I'm, I'm looking at Jesus so closely that I have on blinders, that I'm focusing on him, that nothing else matters in this world but Jesus. You see, if we look to him, he's going to lead us in the right direction. Now, as I, I close uh, this morning, I, I want to uh, want you to notice something there in your Bibles there. If you, if you look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. But if you back up to verse 1, it says that let us run with patience the race, or let us run with endurance. If it says patience there for some reason, let us have endurance for the, the race that is set before us. So, so the same words are used there when it says the joy that was mapped out for Jesus, set before him, he endured 
do at the cross. And so the race that is mapped out before us, we should be able to endure. So what am I saying? What, am I, what, I, what I'm saying here is that if Jesus can endure the cross, then surely we ought to be able to endure this life. You see, when Jesus stepped out of eternity, the course was already set and mapped out for him. John says that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He also says in Revelation that he was the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus already knew what he had to do. And he endured it for me, and he endured it for you. Now, if Jesus was willing to do that for us, how much more shall we be willing to live this life faithful to God? So running the Christian race is not easy. You're going to fall down sometimes. You're going to have some setbacks. You're going to have some roadblocks. But we must endure and persevere until the end. Last scripture this morning, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24. And the message will be yours. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 24. First Corinthians chapter nine and verses 24 and 25, Paul says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that ye may obtain. So that is you run the race so that you can win the race. Otherwise, why run it? You run the race so that you can receive the prize. But look at verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, an incorruptible. So people run races all the time. Right? And when they run the race, they expect some type of reward at the end of the race. But the reward that someone can give you in this life is going to be a reward that's going to one day pass away when the world passes away. The crown of life that God promises to us is going to be something that lasts throughout eternity that no one can take away. So he says, run the race so as you're trying to win the prize. And so my encouragement to each one of you today is that we all remain faithful to God. Despite the things we may experience in our lives, don't give up on God. Don't let go of God. I want you to remember that the reason why we are here today is because of God and the great sacrifice that he made through Jesus Christ. So don't give up on God. Don't, don't stop being faithful to God because God promises is if, that, if we remain faithful to him and endure to the end, then he's going to save us. He's going to save us. Now, you got to get in the race, as you said before, about being born again. Uh, if you're not a Christian today, you can become a Christian by obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is... You must believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day and now sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. You must repent of your sins. That is, anything you got going on in your life that you need to change, now is the time to make that change. There's no better time to make a change than today. Then he says, we must be willing to confess his name before men. That is, I am not ashamed to say that I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Can you make that confession? And after that, we must be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. That's the gospel. That's what the Bible teaches us we must do in order to be saved. And my encouragement to you is that uh, if you are not a Christian, that you seriously consider those things. And if you are a Christian. God is always willing and ready to forgive. The only thing he asks us to do is to repent and confess our sins. And so the message is yours today. If there's anyone who needs to respond to the invitation, please do so as we stand and sing.